Here's a quick video overview on astronomical literature searching. Why do you care about astronomical literature searching? Well, searching the literature really is a critical part of the scientific process. You need to know who came before you and what they did. So a real life example that might apply to any of my teams is that in all these cases, we're not discovering the cluster. We're not naming the cluster. Others have looked at it, but in other wavelengths, other than the wavelengths we're going to use. Or another example would be that other people used similar approaches as we're going to use to find young stars. And so we need to learn from their approaches and their mistakes. In any case, if you're planning on presenting your work in a public forum, such as the American Astronomical Society meeting, there's a pretty good chance you will run into people who have studied the same object as you are studying, and they will be put out if you don't know about their work. So it's super important to spend some time looking in the literature. There are three main astronomical literature databases, and they're, they're, they're indexed com with different ways and different goals, and they have different strengths and weaknesses. And it really does pay to think about looking in all three of them and to actually approach it using their strengths in all three of them. So the biggest, most biggest war horse that people think about when they think of literature databases is ADS, the Astronomical Data System. This is an archive managed by Harvard and the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory. It talks to the journal websites. It talks to AstroPH, which is the preprint archive. It talks to conference proceedings publishers. And they have worked really hard to scan in old articles back even into the 1800s. So their primary search approach is to work with the articles themselves. Another um, archive, big archive, is called SIMBAD, which is technically an acronym that refers to the set of identifications, measurements, and bibliography for astronomical data. This one is managed in France. And I note that specifically because when it is the middle of the night in France, that is a good time for them to do database ma management and, and computer management and take the system down to check things. That's the middle of the day for us. So sometimes when you're sitting in the US and you try to talk to the Simbad database, if it's down, that's why it's not managed by a place in the US, it's managed by a place in France. Their primary approach is to go to, to index by the objects, to index by the object names, the positions on the sky. And from within Simbad, you can search by position or search by the object name and get access to all the papers that mention things in that region or the thing that you searched on. And it provides interlinks to ADS just as ADS provides interlinks back to Simbad. The third major archive is NED, the NASA Extragalactic Database. It's managed at, by IPAC here at Caltech. As you can tell from its name, it is really focused on the extragalactic objects and they have interlinked papers and data in, uh, in a way that's, that's proven really critical for the extragalactic community. But since I'm a galactic astronomer, this talk is going to focus on ADS and SIMBAD and how I use both of these resources to try to find out what I need to know about a particular object or a particular region that includes many objects. So ADS, again, this is provides a link in to the journal articles themselves. And one of the reasons that ADS works very, very well is that we really, as, a, as the astronomical community, have been functioning with essentially open access literature for a long time, essentially forever, uh, you know, given the, the, the speed of things in the digital world. Um, we, there's a preprint server, and most articles get posted first to that preprint server. It's spelled this funny A-R-X-I-V, it's pronounced archive, and this is also referred to as AstroPH. And the articles usually ap appear on the archive well before they appear in the journal. But what that means is anything can get posted to archive. So your mileage may vary. 
you have to look at who's doing the posting, where their affiliations are, and you need to look at the notes that go with each one of those articles um, before you decide whether or not to believe it. Professional astronomers are going to post to archive usually when it's accepted to a peer-reviewed journal. Sometimes they post it when they've just submitted it. If it's a super hot topic and people want to make sure that, hey, I got here first. Um, there are other fields of science that post things on archive too. I think originally it was a high energy physics preprint server. Now there's math and all kinds of other physics. But your mileage may vary here for those other fields of, of science as well. In any case, the content should be the same between the archive preprint and the eventual journal article. But the journal process adds some editing and typesetting and cleaning up and usually there are far fewer pages to print in the journal article than it was in the, the preprint server version. Typically, the typeset article that the journal produces is behind a paywall, uh, or which means that you can't get to it from your home computer. Um, you can maybe get access it, to it from your library, depends on what subscriptions your library has. Um, but you can, it's behind a paywall usually only for one to a few years. Um, but in any case, the archive version is free and it's got the same content. So again, ADS is, at the end of the day, indexing the text. It is trying to be smart about it, but really it is linked to what appears in the text. So it tries to be clever. Like for example, CEF-C is treated the same as CEP-C, which is CEF space C and CEP space C. But it also understands that Cepheid is, may be a related term, and so it's going to give you the results for Cepheid as well. ADS is going to give you a wide variety of quality of papers. The gold standard is, of course, the referee journal articles, and that's what ADS will, will point you to. You can also, of course, get the journal articles that were posted to AstroPH, the preprint server. That, at that point, the preprint server version may or may not be refereed yet. ADS will also point you to data sets that are delivered to various archives, which is awesome if you're trying to collect the data. But you do actually need the journal article, or the, at least the paper that goes with that data, to be able to use the data properly. ADS will also give you full articles from conference proceedings, which are generally not refereed. It will also give you just abstracts from conferences that don't have conference proceedings. These are in general not refereed and moreover you don't get the whole paper just the abstract. And the abstracts from proposals are also in there. So at the very least you know from those proposals that somebody's working on whatever the, the abstract describes. But this really is in order from most to least useful. I find the abstracts from proposals to be the least useful. Abstracts from conferences without conference proceedings and, you know, sometimes they can be useful if you can from there get pointed to the ultimate journal article, um, but usually it's the top three bullets here that really matter. The referee journal articles, any preprints to the preprint server, and data sets that are delivered to the archives. Simbad, in contrast, is linked to position on the sky. And the reason why you need this is that nomenclature is just a nightmare in astronomy. Every new catalog that comes out, every new survey, introduces more names. And you end up with many, many names for the same object. Some objects I've seen have more than 20 names or more than 40 names. ADS ultimately is going by text. So if you are searching for something by a particular name, but somebody else has a paper on it with a completely different name, if you search in ADS on only the one name, you may not find papers using the other name. But if you use Simbad and search by position, it disambiguates this problem. That's a funny word. I suspect it's just a word in the astronomical culture. Disambiguates meaning it's removing the ambiguity. It, so, it, it uh, resolves the issue of using different names because if you're talking about something at the same position at the sky, then it's pretty clear where you're working. It's also true that astronomers tend to have tunnel vision. So in the constellation Perseus, there is a really big molecular cloud called the Perseus molecular cloud. And I'm interested in the young stars there. So I know almost all the papers on young stars in Perseus. 
But it turns out there's a famous galaxy cluster in Perseus too. And because of the surveys that I have in Perseus, I might accidentally have data for some of those galaxy cluster sources. So I can look in Simbad to find the cross identifications for all these objects in the regions. And then I can, using Simbad, go back through the literature, follow the trail of breadcrumbs, and identify other papers talking about non-YSOs that might be in my survey. Again, Simbad is position-driven. So you want to search by name or by position, and you're going to find everything in a region, whether that region is big or small. Then you can work through the list of objects to go back and find the original papers. Simbad does include some data, but it is fairly notoriously unreliable at getting some of these data. So you should not accept as gospel. You should take with a grain of salt any of the V magnitudes, the multiband uh, magnitudes, the spectral types, or even the classifications of objects. The classifications of objects in Simbad are often really weird. So just because Simbad says it's a YSO, you should not believe that it's a YSO. And if Simbad doesn't say it's a YSO, it doesn't mean it's not a YSO. So you have to be really cautious with what you believe with the basic data for each object, but it does provide reliable links to the original articles, and then you can go chase the original data in those original articles. You can also use Simbad to find out what other named objects are near a particular object or in a region that you care about. And, you know, like I said, there may be other papers using different names that you have missed if you just search in ADS. So ADS, the original old style query form, looks like this. Um, there's boxes that you can put in different things. So you can put in authors in the author box. You can put in an object name in here. You can put in the range of publication dates over which you want to search. You can put in the title words or the abstract words. So it's pretty straightforward. You put things in the box. If you scroll down a little bit, you have additional parameters. And really one of the most important sections here is that. You can tell it, look, I really want all bibliographic sources, or I just want articles, not abstracts, or I just want refereed articles, or I just want the non-refereed articles. So that filter is something I use all the time to just get refereed papers or just look for conference proceedings. It's Everything else here is less important, in my opinion, than those issues right there. So this is what the results of an ADS search look like. I, I searched on my name and I asked it for everything, not just refereed, uh, not just unrefereed, I asked it for everything. And here it found a whole bunch of stuff, but here's how you read the results. So this right there is a bibliography code and it's got the authors underneath it. What this is telling me is that if you look at this code and the others, I had a pretty busy AAS. All of these are AAS poster abstracts from the January 2016 AAS. So it says 2016, because that's when it was, AAS, because it was a AAS meeting, and then the rest of the numerical code here is telling us about exactly which poster this was. So it was AAS number 227, and this poster was 246.13. And the A over here is just another way of accessing the abstract. If you click on that, you get a list of the abstract. If you click on the A, you get the abstract. Um, if you scroll down further, you can find more refereed stuff. So that one is a paper from 2015 in the Astronomical Journal, uh, issue 150, page 175. If you look down even further, you can find that I've written a Spitzer proposal recently, um, or I've been co-author on a Spitzer proposal that is looking at stars in the Lagoon Nebula. So this is how you kind of start to interpret what this page is telling you. Uh, if you actually click on any of these blue links. Let's click on this one right here. It takes you to a page that has all the information about that paper. So it's got a whole bunch of things here at the top which are really, really useful. I can go and use this abstract, this abstract, this information to find similar abstracts. I can go get the HTML version of the article. I can get the PDF version of the article. I can get the link in the preprint server. I can get a list of the references in the article. I can get a list of objects from Simbad that are in this article. I can also get a list of articles that other people read after they read this one. If you, you know, you can see here that the title is there and then there's all the authors. And these are all the author affiliations. I, this was a multi-author paper. You scroll down far enough, 
You find out more information about the publication specifics, when it was a, when it was published, who the publisher was, the keywords that go with it, the date of insertion, and the bibliographic code, and then here's the actual abstract. Now ADS is moving towards a new version called Bumblebee. This is what Bumblebee looks like, and you can see it's by default. It's the modern interface, and it's just got one form you put it in, and it gives you some examples down here. You can also, if you want, pick the classic look, um, which then looks a lot more like the traditional uh, form that I showed you earlier. It has some different um, boxes. It doesn't have all the variety of boxes, but it has a lot of them. It has the most important bits. So I did a search on my name in that one, in, in this, inter uh, sorry, in this interface where it's just one line and this is what I got back. I put in my name, but it did a full text search to look for instances of my name that appear in the literature. So here I'm in the reference list, and in the next one I'm in the reference list. So what I need to do is to limit the results so that it only includes my name. And then you get the filter up here that says I just want papers authored by me. And then it comes up with the same results that we did, that we had using the more traditional form. It's because it's talking to the same da database, it's just a different interface to it. You can also see the rate at which I'm writing refereed articles and going to conferences. You can see when I started graduate school, and that dip there is a reflection of when my son was born. So here are some things to try with ADS. You can find all papers by me or by any other astronomer you know. Um, you can try to figure out which ones are refereed and which ones are conference proceedings. You could search by a target of choice with, with whatever name you want um, and find the most recent paper on that target. Here's an example of finding a specific paper. You want to go find this specific paper in ADS. You can also look for how many papers I've published or Varjan's published or anybody else and look for how many refereed articles we've published. You could also look and see if I and Varjan have ever co-authored a refereed journal article together. You could also try to find a paper on any subject published in a journal this month, or a paper on that same subject that was posted to the web this week. So again, that's the ADS interface. But if you look up at the upper right, you can see that it is linking to Simbad, and you saw before in the results it was also linking to Simbad. Simbad's front page looks like this, and the most important thing here is searching by identifier or searching by coordinates. So if we go and query by coordinates, this is the search by coordinates, I'm going to put in the coordinates of the center of the CEPH-C map that, um, that we're going to work on in 2016 here, and I'm going to ask it to give me all the targets within 10 arc minutes. Now you can tell, you know, there's, there's d subtle differences in culture between this database and the ADS database. And one thing that's sort of a tell that it's a European database is I don't think any native English speaker would say the following writings are allowed. It's just a tell that these, you know, these folks are, in, are, are not in the US. So this is what the results are for that particular search that we did. So it's giving us 147 sources that it found in the region that we asked for, cent you know, so centered on this position with a radius of 10 arc minutes. And this is where they fall in the sky. You can grab and drag this window around. Um, and these are all the sources that it found. So it found, you know, it's, it's sorting them in distance from the, the coordinate we gave it. So that one it said is 24 arc seconds away from the target. And it says it's a young star. That one it says is a submillimeter source. So the things to notice here are these names. The names follow some patterns. This one talks about GMM 2009. This one has a two mass name. There's another GMM 2009. So that's those two sources are coming from the same paper. JCMT, that's a different nomenclature. Now we're back to two mass. Remember these names are positions. So to read this, it's 23 hours, five minutes, 46.74 seconds, 62 degrees, 31 minutes, 0.05 seconds. So those are two mass names. You go down further and I bet you find different name patterns. But even in the you know dozen sources here, 
there's really only three different name patterns. There's the GMM2009, the TMS, and the JCMT. So this is what you get when you click on one of those names. Here's This is the first one off the list, CGMM2009 sub C11. There it is. So it's giving us what it knows. It doesn't know a lot. It's got a big white space here because there's supposed to be a place for magnitudes, but it doesn't have any magnitudes in there. And that's the position, that that's pretty much it. And you can see that it's picked a DSS image and there is nothing at that location um, because this is a pretty embedded cluster. And in order to figure out why we don't have an optical, we're going to have to go to this GMM 2009 paper. How do we find that paper? Well, if we scroll down a little bit, it tells you there was one reference that it found between 1850 and 2016. So what you want to do is click on Display Reference Summary, and it gives you a list of all of the papers that it found. In this case, just one. So this is the Gutermuth et al. 2009. The origin of the nomenclature is the first three initials of the first, or sorry, the first initial of the first three authors in 2009 for the year in which it appears. And so if you scroll down a little bit more, you can find um, more information about the nomenclature and a link to ADS services. Now, mind you, when you click on that, you're going to go to the French copy of ADS, which is going to be noticeably smaller than the, uh, sorry, noticeably slower than the uh, Harvard copy of ADS, but at least you get access to the information there. Now, and I want to emphasize too that it's got two of the tables from this paper available. So it's the original data tables are available in plain text form. So here are some things that you can try out with Sinbad. How many synonyms, how many other names or aliases does HD233517 have? How many papers mention this source? How about how many other names or papers does Barnard Star have? The center of the YSO observations for CEPHC is 23 hours, 5 minutes, 51 seconds, 62 degrees, 30 minutes, 55 seconds. So how many objects does Sinbad find within a 15 arc second radius? I'll make another movie about how to read scientific papers, which is the next step.